Okay, so welcome back. Um, recently we've been talking about what you see here in the upper right, which is a fully functional Arduino Uno, but it also has the additional capability that it can communicate over Wi-Fi. And it's a very inexpensive device. It's like five US dollars. And you can see here, we've got it disconnected from everything except a USB smartphone battery. We've also been developing the application you see on the left, which is a C-sharp application, which configures a client-server configuration so we can talk to the Arduino over Wi-Fi using the C-sharp application running on our desktop. And the application we've done so far allows us to use this Arduino to measure the frequency of the wall outlet voltage supplied by your power company and display it in this C-sharp application on your main computer. And what I'll do is I'll start up the application, press start, and you can see it is starting what we call a TCP listener and it's accepting clients on port 49002. Again, I encourage you to look at the previous videos where we talk about Wi-Fi and client server and all of that and how to get this all set up. And what it is doing is, is waiting for this Arduino to turn on. You can see I have the power off. It's waiting for the Arduino to turn on, and at that point, it will connect with it and grab data from the Arduino. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this battery on to supply the Arduino, and you can see the lights come on, and in a few seconds, we should see the TCP listener. There you go. It recognizes the client connected from the IP address 192.168.0.10. And it's instantiating what's called a network stream. And you can see that zero in the um, display is uh, what it's reading from the Arduino. And the Arduino is not measuring anything right now because it's not connected. But it is uh, updating every half second. It's updating this red value. And what we're going to do in this video is we are going to add a feature that didn't exist in the previous C Sharp application. Right now, you can see it's all connected and reading data. However, if I turn this Arduino off, if I disconnect the power, the application we had, it would just lock up. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a feature to this C Sharp application that will allow us to turn off the Arduino, disconnect it, which is kind of simulating if we had this Arduino moving around remotely and say we got out of Wi-Fi range, and we could no longer connect, and then we came back in, it would be nice to be able to gracefully recognize, okay, it's no longer available, and I'm gonna go back to listen for clients. And then if this does come back in range, it will automatically pick this up as a new client. And I've done that with the C-Sharp application, so let me show you, if I turn this off, I've turned off the power, and in a few seconds, it's gonna recognize, hey, We've lost connection, and there you see client got disconnected. Now it's going back to just listening for clients on that port 49002. And then I can turn this Arduino back on. You see the lights come on. And in a few seconds, it's going to say, hey, we just accepted that connection. And you can see it's got a new network stream. We've incremented the number. Now it's got the second network stream that it's connected to, and it's grabbing data. So we're going to show you how to modify this C-sharp application to give us this functionality. Now here is our C-sharp Visual Studio Windows Forms application. Uh, we've already built this previously. I encourage you to look at the previous video. Uh, but we have made some changes to allow us to gracefully recognize when we've lost contact with one of the clients and then reconnect when the client is available. So um, what we've got here is in our design, as we have before, we've just got a text box, we've got a label, and we've got three buttons. And to get the event handlers, just double click on the buttons. And this is our application. It's, got, it's set up the way I normally do with regions to separate the documents, to-do lists, parameters, methods, and event handlers. And then we'll start out with the using statements, the standard using.system, system.net, .NET sockets, so we can set up the TCP connection. System.threading.task, so we can do some asynchronous, and I did a video on async and tasks. I encourage you to look at that. And then systemwindows.forms. So as we had before, we've got our region of the documents to do. 
and parameters. Now we did make some changes to the parameters. We've got the same TCP port. We talked before about why we chose that. I encourage you to look at that video. And then we have a integer that's going to keep track of how many times we connect to a new client and that's called stream nums. And then we're going to have a boolean we may not need but it's um, if we want to continue waiting for clients it starts out as true we can use our pause button to set that to false and stop waiting for clients and here we've got a byte array that is going to hold whatever data we get from the client and it's called bytes and we're going to set it to 1024 which presumably is the size of our input buffer and then we also have string data. We're going to take the incoming bytes and convert that to a string that we're going to call data. So those are the only changes to the parameters. And we've got our initialized component and we've got the three event handlers for the three buttons. You can imagine they don't do much. The exit button is like always application exit. Button pause you may not use, but we're just uh, taking that Boolean get clients. We can set it to false, which means we will stop waiting for clients. Uh, again, you may not need that. And the real work here is done by the start button that calls this listener method like we had before. And all of the modification is going to be in that listener method. Okay, so button start just calls listener. And here is where all of the changes are going to be. Again, this is an asynchronous method because we're going to be waiting on different threads for some of the functionality but it's a public async void and I've modified this listener method to add some more documentation and also to clean it up a bit and allow us to recognize when we've lost the client and then pick it up when it returns. So the first thing we've got a text box one we're going to say hey we're started the TCP listener we're going to be listening for clients and we're just going to sit there and wait and then we are going to define this TCP listener we're going to call it server new TCP listener uh, whatever IP address and the TCP port that we've already specified 49002 and then we're going to start the listener and this is just going to sit there and wait for a client to connect now what I've done is I've added a while loop while we want to continue to get clients we've got that boolean uh, normally it's just going to be true and we're just going to have this while loop that's going to operate continually and it's going to wait to get a client and to grab data from the client and if we lose a client we're going to uh, just sit there and wait for the next client. So while get clients is true what we're going to do is um, if a connection exists the server will accept it. So we got this text box one to pen text accepting clients on port whatever that TCP port which is 49002 dot string so we're waiting and we're going to have a TCP client client is the result of us awaiting accept TCP client async so we're asynchronously going to go out and wait for clients to connect and when we have one we're going to call it client that's going to be our TCP client and now we've got a client at this point a remote client has been accepted and what we're going to do is we're going to first grab the IP address so we can tell the user what the IP address is. And that's going to be a string. We're going to call it client IP client.client.remoteEndpoint.toString. That's going to grab the IP address and text box one append text client connected from IP address. Whatever that client IP string is defines the IP address. So now we're connected. We've grabbed the IP address. Now this line of code is going to be really important. So let's go take a look at why this is something we need to worry about this client.receive timeout. So as you may have noticed in different programming when you're doing uh, data streams, um, sometimes the data stream, when you try to read data from a stream, it will sit there and just kind of wait forever to get data. And often you don't want it to do that. You want to say, okay, only wait for a short amount of time or until you get a certain character string and then that's what we want to read and we can go ahead and proceed. So you got to be careful when you're doing reading from streams. For example, with the Arduino, there is a serial dot read string until which says, hey, stop reading when you see a certain character or string. 
If not, if you don't say read string until, it will just sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait until it gets a string. And you want it to say, hey, when I've got a, like an end of line character, that's good. Come back and we'll process it. Don't just wait forever. Same thing with C sharp. Um, when you read a stream like we're doing with our Wi-Fi, our network stream from the TCP client, there is a timeout. And the default is if you ask to read data from a stream, the default is zero, which means it's going to never timeout. It will wait forever for data unless you tell me otherwise. So you got to be really careful when you do a read in these network streams that we're doing. Um, it might wait forever. If, so if your client disconnects, this thing will just sit there and wait and wait and wait, but the client's disconnected, so it's never going to get data. So what you need to do is you need to say, hey, wait a minute. I want you to read from the stream, but if you wait like five seconds and get no response, that means the client's gone, disconnected. So I want you to come back and stop waiting so we can deal with it appropriately. So we're going to set this timeout that says, hey, if you haven't gotten a response in like five seconds, come back and we're going to disconnect that client and start waiting for other clients. So really, really important when you're reading from streams in multiple, multiple cases, you got to be careful because it may not give you what you expect. It may sit there and wait forever and you have to make sure to tell it what you want it to do if it doesn't get the data or doesn't get the data that you expect. So that's why we have this client.receive timeout. What that means is we want you to wait for 5,000 milliseconds in this case. When we ask you to read from the client in your network stream, if you wait for five seconds and don't have data, come back to me and tell me, hey, we're not getting anything, so then I can shut that client down and start waiting for the next client. So by default, the network stream read method will wait forever for incoming data from a client, even if that client has disconnected. Therefore, we need to set a limit, which allows us to close that connection and wait for a new one. So very important, this line of code. So we're going to increment. We've got a new client at this point. We've connected. We've set the timeout. And now what we can do is we say, okay, this is, we're going to increment the number of streams to start out at zero. So now we've got stream number one we've connected with, and we are instantiating what's called a network stream. And we're saying network stream, in this case, one. So this is our first one. And then we're saying network stream NS equals client.getStream. This is basically for that client we've connected with, setting up a network stream, and we're going to call it NS. And we know that if we ask it to read, it's only going to wait for five seconds and then to jump out. So what we're going to do is we're going to define an integer i, which indicates how many bytes have been read from the network stream. If we say read data, read bytes, and it does have bytes to read, it's going to tell us this integer i is going to be how many bytes it read. And then what we're going to do is we're going to loop to receive all the data sent by the client in the buffer and place it into a byte array called bytes, which can contain up to 1024 bytes, which we showed before in the parameters. Again, if the read timeout isn't set, it defaults to no timeout, and this will continually wait for data even if the client doesn't exist. So we're going to do a network stream dot read. And as we did before, it's going to be, here's the byte array that it's going to read into the 1024 byte array called bytes, uh, no offset, and it's going to be whatever this length of the array. So it's going to return i, which is how many bytes it read. We're going to say, read this many bytes and return how many bytes you actually read. So now we know there's i bytes in this bytes array. So we're going to have a while loop here, and that's going to take those bytes that we've read, process them, and then try to read more. So while i is not equal zero, while there is a number of bytes that we've actually read, first we're going to translate that byte array into an ASCII string like we did before. We're going to do data, which is the string version of that byte array, is system.text.encoding.ascii.getString. And we're going to convert that bytes, and we're going to say starting at index 0 and the count, which is i. 
And then now we've converted that. In our case, it's going to be like a 60.00 string of the frequency. And we're going to convert that to a string and put that in label1.text. And then we're going to wait for, in this case, 100 milliseconds. Now, as we talked about before, we set up our Arduino to only send data every half a second or 500 milliseconds. You can change that, but um, since data is only being sent from the ESP8266 client every 500 milliseconds, and from the AT Mega every 100 milliseconds, we're going to add a delay. And we're going to do this await task.delay 100 milliseconds. So it's going to wait and then go through and try again to read data from the buffer. And it's going to do this continuously. While i is not equal to zero, while there's actually bytes being read, we're going to keep trying to read bytes. And we're going to say the same thing, ns.read byte into the bytes array, bytes.length, and try. And if we have successfully read, we'll get a value of i. Now again, this is while i is not equal to zero, if it fails to read within five seconds, in our case, 5,000 milliseconds, if it fails, it's going to do in this try catch, it's going to get an exception. If it times out, it's going to come here. And what we want to do is we want to break out of the while loop and restart the waiting for clients. And the way to do that is to say i equals zero, because the while loop only works if i is not equal to zero. So we're going to say i equals zero and then continue. And that will break out of this while loop. And it will say, OK, um, we couldn't read within five seconds. So we're going to say client got disconnected. And we're going to close that client. And we're going to go back here, this while loop, which is always running. And we're going to do it again. We've already got the TCP listener running. But we're going to try and connect to a new client. We're going to wait to accept a TCP client and go through the same thing all over again. So this is how we can detect loss of a client and then close that client if we don't get any data within five seconds and then do it all over again. So that's about it. Um, we've done some modifications here, but it's really not a big change. The listener is the most important part of this. So let's take a look at this operating in action where we're actually measuring a frequency from our signal generator and see how it will recover if we lose and then reconnect with our client. So now you can see I've got my Arduino with battery power. It's connected up to a signal generator and they're located about 40 feet away from my computer and the router with the Wi-Fi. And they're actually down two floors in the same building, but it's about 40 feet away. And you can see I am getting a connection with the Arduino over the Wi-Fi. And what I'm going to do is I am going to turn off the battery power to the Arduino to see if it gracefully um, disconnects the client. And then I'm going to turn the power back on to see if it comes back. And even though it's 40 feet away, see if it still reconnects and see if I can change the frequency in the signal generator to get a different value in our C-sharp application. So now I've turned off the power and you can see client got disconnected and now it's again waiting for new clients. And it's maintained the, it saved the old value of frequency. You can modify that if you want to have it go to zero or whatever. So what I'll do is I'll turn on the power again to the Arduino, see if it reconnects, and then I'll vary the frequency to see if it can read the new values. So you can see it um, reconnected and successfully reads the changing values of the frequency of the signal generator. And you can see it's in a, it started up a second stream. So looks like everything works. In the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to put all this together. And we are going to build a remote frequency measurement box with an external Wi-Fi antenna and put all this into that box so that we can remotely measure frequency of the wall outlet wherever we want. So that's about it for this one. If you're liking these videos, I encourage you to hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell notifications. 
But most of all, please let others know that we're here so we get some views. Really appreciate it. Otherwise, take care. Have a really good day. Thanks.